Gentlemen, start your engines! When Sterling Marlin teamed up with Morgan McClure Racing for the 1994 Winston Cup season, nobody realized that it would unlock Sterling's potential. The duo went out and won the Daytona 500 in their first start together, which was also the first win of Sterling's Winston Cup career. They found more success throughout the season and eventually finished 14th in points. Sterling built on that success in 1995, repeating in the Daytona 500 and picking up wins at Darlington and Talladega en route to a career best third in points. The team entered the 1996 campaign as one of the many title favorites. The team wasn't able to win a third straight Daytona 500 as engine issues forced the team to retire on lap 81. Marlin put together a string of solid finishes capped off by a win at Talladega in the ninth race of the season, putting their driver fifth in the standings. A few races later, Marlin won again at Daytona. Through the season's first 17 races, Marlin sat sixth in points after two wins, four top fives, and eight top tens. Marlin returned to Talladega in July in hopes of defending his crown at the track, but those hopes were dashed in horrifying fashion. Marlin was battling Dale Earnhardt for the lead on lap 116 when contact between the two and Ernie Irvin sent the two leaders hard into the wall. Earnhardt's car went flying through the air, leaving him with a broken collarbone and sternum. Marlin immediately climbed from his battered Chevrolet to inspect the damage. Earnhardt was left needing relief for the next few races as he battled to recover from his injuries. Marlin did not miss any time nor require any assistance, but it makes us wonder. We've always had conversations with each other about how interesting it was that Marlin all of a sudden disappeared from the front of the field during the end of his time in the Kodak car. You see this from time to time in the Cup Series, where things just fade and the magic of a partnership can just dissolve. After listening to Ricky Craven talk about his injuries during his appearance on the Dale Jr. download, it made us look into Marlin's career a little bit closer. Looking back, was it just a coincidence that this single incident marked the beginning of the downfall for Marlin and the team? Or was Marlin possibly battling injuries suffered in the crash, whether he knew it or not? As we tell you what happened to Marlin on the track, just remember that we mentioned that over the first 17 races of the 1996 season, he was 6th in points, had 2 wins, 4 top 5s, and 8 top 10s. Over the final 14 races of the season, after his crash, Marlin had 0 wins, 1 top 5, and 2 top 10s, and dropped to 8th in the standings. He was outscored by Cup champion Terry Labonte by an incredible 648 points over those 14 races. Marlin had 3 DNFs over that span, but it wasn't really like he had many issues. He simply just didn't run that well. The 1997 season was just absolutely abysmal for the team. Marlin finished 25th in points and didn't win a single race. He only collected two top fives and six top tens over the season's 32 races. That marked the fourth and final season in the Kodak colors for Marlin, who moved on to drive the number 40 Coors Light Chevrolet for Felix Sabatis in 1998. With a full off-season behind him, Marlin won his Gatorade Twin 125 qualifying race at Daytona in February, building tons of excitement for the new duo. Marlin took the number 40 car to six top tens and finished 13th in points, a finish more on par with his career to this point. We think that one of the more telling signs that something might not have been right with Marlin after his Talladega crash is the success of not only Marlin in the number 40, but Bobby Hamilton in the Kodak car as well. Marlin took over the number 40 car that was driven by Robbie Gordon and Greg Sachs in 1997. Those two drivers struggled heavily, finishing 33rd or worse in 14 races while failing to qualify five times. Marlin, on the other hand, only finished worse than 33rd four times in 1998 and only failed to make the field once. At the same time, Hamilton found an incredible amount of success in the number 4 car that season. He finished 10th in points and took the car to victory lane at Martinsville in absolutely dominating fashion, winning the pole and leading 378 of the 500 laps. From 1990 to 1996, that number 4 car was a borderline top 10 car in points, finishing no lower than 14th. Then, Marlin's tumultuous 1997 came around where he was 25th. Hamilton took over and immediately was back inside the top 10 and followed that up with a 13th in 1999 before the funding and success of the single car operation slowly started to fade before the team eventually closed its doors in 2007. 
Marlon found more success as the years went by in the number 40 car, grabbing two wins and finishing third in the point standings in 2001 and two more wins in 2002. That season, he led the point standings from February to September, but eventually was injured in a crash at Kansas, ending his season. The aging driver never seemed to recover from this injury, finishing 18th in points in 2003, followed by a decrease in stats across the board until he retired in 2009. To us, it's incredibly interesting where the line was drawn in the sand at the end of the duo's success together. They showed no signs of slowing down, and after the crash, everything went downhill. Over the years, speaking out about your own injuries and taking care of your body and mind has become a priority in the sport and more common to talk about thanks to a handful of drivers including Dale Earnhardt Jr. Back when Marlon was racing, that was far from the mindset. The last thing a driver ever wanted to do was get out of his own car, and no matter what was going on with his body, he was going to try to drive it. Combining all of the things we know about this era and looking back at the stats, We'll always wonder if Sterling was dealing with some kind of issues related to the crash that robbed him of competing to the best of his ability. We will never truly know the reason for the roller coaster statistics at the end of Marlon's tenure with Morgan McClure Racing. We simply made this video because we just found it interesting how the crash seemingly was the end of Marlon's success there. We aren't saying that he was injured in the crash, but then again, we never will truly know. What we do know is that Marlon's disappointing end in the number 4 car will never take away from all of the success that the partnership created and the history that the team made together through the years.